that. These have been two of the best years of my life. I have accomplished goals, lifelong goals, in the, in the last two years. I've written a book. Um, writing a book was a lifelong goal that I used to pass out drunk to thinking maybe I would start that book the next day, every day. And now I don't do that, and I've actually written the book. I got married, I have a child, I'm healthy, and I'm happy, as happy as you can be. Um, but, you know, that, that doesn't make everything perfect. And one of the things that I really struggle with today, and that I've struggled with every day for the last two years, is the fact that I work in design, I work for a digital design and development firm, and the culture of alcohol use is prevalent. It's in everything that we do. It's everywhere we go. Okay, so for, for the first year, I really struggled with that. And I struggled in silence. And then after I hit a year, I felt a little bit empowered. And I know that they're one of the sponsors. Many of you might be familiar with Model View Culture, sort of a critique of the tech industry. Shanley, um, a lot of what they do is, is really great stuff, and it really highlights in, in words a lot of the things that you hear today, um, audio. But uh, so I wrote an article talking about my experience and basically saying, look, I'm somebody who's struggling a lot with our culture, and I'm starting to experience a lot of success in other areas of my life. And, and I think we actually need to start addressing this culture to support people who are not only like me, but might have other issues around alcohol. And so that's the point of this presentation is also that it, it's not all about me. As much as I really would like it to be, I do love being the center of attention and I want things to be really about me, it's not. And so statistically we know that about one in, out of every six people struggles with alcohol use and abuse problems. So the CDC says, Binge drinking happens really frequently. So one out of every six people binge drinks four times a month. Well, what does that even mean? That means one out of six people four times a month goes out and on average consumes eight alcoholic beverages in a two-hour time period. You don't make good decisions after you've consumed eight alcoholic beverages in two, two hours. That's not the definition of binge drinking. The definition of binge drinking is four or five alcoholic beverages in two hours. But when you actually do the math, it comes out to people are consuming, people who binge drink are consuming eight alcoholic beverages in a two hour time period. So it's not me, I'm not the only person out there and if you look around and you work for a company of 60 people, that suggests 10 of them four times a month are putting themselves in a situation like this. So what else? Well, it's the second leading cause of what's called preventable death in the United States. The first is smoking and smoking is about double this 88,000 numbers but to put this in context, opioid use, including heroin, kills about 40,000 people a year. So it's, it's contextual in that it's how we talk about it. We don't talk about alcohol like it's an epidemic that's killing people. We do talk about illicit drug use like it's an epidemic that's killing people. And Vox.com, there's an interesting article that talks about it like that. What if reporters and the media discussed alcohol use the same way we talk about illicit drug use? And it would be, there's an epidemic, it's killing people, it's causing people to go out in public and throw up in the streets. Well, it's really, when, when illicit drugs are doing that, you hear about it, you know, naked guy running down the freeway. I've seen a lot of people do a lot of really crazy shit when they're drunk, and that's a completely legal drug, but you don't hear about this epidemic of, of this psychotic inducing drug that's sweeping the nation called alcohol and causing people to do crazy things. So we don't talk about alcohol the same way we do other drugs. There's a cost to it. If you're an employer or a taxpayer, you're paying for some of the costs attached to alcohol use and abuse. So the average is $2 for every drink is going towards costs in healthcare, increases in crime. There's a lot of crime that is directly associated with alcohol use, and then also lost productivity. I can tell you from my experience, I was a heck of a lot less productive on the day after blacking out drunk. I would come into work much more concerned about how do I delete all those crazy tweets that I sent last night and repair all the relationships that I damaged last night versus get my job done over the next eight to 10 hours? So there's a lot of uh, lost productivity that we need to recoup in terms of reducing alcohol. All right, it's still not all about me, although I wish it was. After I published my Model View Culture article, I got a lot of email follow-up and I started hearing from people that it's not just issues with not being sober, it's actually that a lot of people 
really aren't comfortable with alcohol for a lot of reasons. Some people, they're pregnant or they have medical conditions. That's not a newsflash. We've always known about that. But these people aren't comfortable when they're put in situations where alcohol consumption is the norm and everybody in that situation is expected to be doing that. Okay? Another thing, some people, this actually was news to me, sadly. Some people are uncomfortable with alcohol because it's impacted their life negatively through others, okay? Mom, dad, uncle, something bad happened and they directly attach what happened to alcohol. They are not comfortable being in a room full of people getting drunk. Now, if you're sober in any way, being in a room full of drunk people isn't comfortable. But if you're sober because by choice you have a relationship with alcohol that you're not comfortable with it because of things that have happened to you in the past, it's exacerbated. And why would you want to put yourself in a situation? Why would you want to hang out with a bunch of drunk people when it, it brings back these bad memories? So that was a surprise to me. Again, it's so much beyond me. There's people out there who are trying to stay away from alcohol because they're just not comfortable with it. And then, we have people who cannot legally drink. And in design and tech, we know that we skew really young. Let's get interns in. Let's get co-op opportunities in. We have people in my office, we have four people right now who are under the age of 21. So these people cannot legally drink. And I believe we are committing a crime to give them alcohol. So those are all people that we need to consider when we think about what I call our culture of alcohol use and abuse, the, uh, promoting alcohol use and abuse. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So I could have done a collage of two, 300 tweets and LinkedIn updates and Facebook posts and websites that say why you should work with our firm that all discuss the fact that alcohol is present, okay? I know when I look for a job, um, not that I ever would, I'm totally happy where I'm at right now, but <laughs> if I were to look for a job and I were to wind up on a come work for us page for a design or a tech firm, the office keg is often discussed in some way, shape, or form. When we give people a tour of our office, we talk about the office keg. We even have this cool thing called the R keg. What? A video game machine that inside has a keg that dispenses beer. You can play video games and reach around the corner and drink beer. So that's, that's a, it's a selling point. Come work for us. Our culture is so cool. We have a keg, we have a beer fridge, we have hard liquor in the closet, whatever. And, and it's, not, it's not frowned upon, you know? So we have these things in the open. That also means you can consume them, right? They're not just sitting in the corner gathering dust. So you're not gonna be surprising anyone if at two in the afternoon you have a beer sitting on your desk or you're hitting the keg or whatever. So it's really become ingrained in the culture of design and tech that, that alcohol is present. Networking events. Um, e even after sort of creating this broader name around my activity related to increasing um, inclusion and reducing the focus on alcohol use, I get invited to come to our um, happy hour networking socializing event at a bar. These are very much where we go. We expect people to show up and socialize over a beer. Well, what if that? What if somebody's not comfortable socializing over a beer? Does that mean they shouldn't be socializing? Does that mean they shouldn't be networking? Does that mean they shouldn't be interested in a potential job opportunity? Our conferences, not this one, are sometimes referred to as parties in disguise. Google it, something will come up. I'm sure it's a conference because I took it directly from a conference homepage. Um, a party in disguise, in my mind, is another way of saying a lot of alcohol is going to be served. Um, and maybe that's how I interpret it due to my experiences in the world, but that's the way I read it. When I hear a party in disguise, I think, okay, there's gonna be a lot of time spent in a bar or with an open bar wherever people are gonna be socializing. Something good happens. Let's go to the bar and, and um, you know, if it's company sponsored, why have a limit on the number of drinks people can get? Let's celebrate with 10 rounds if we want to. The expectation is that when we bring in clients, we're gonna have dinner, we're gonna have drinks. You know, They might get a little bit looser with telling us what their plans are for money that they're gonna be spending in the next year. We might get a little more friendly with them and they might remember this was a great time. So uh, alcohol is part of that equation. The part that really bothers me about this though and the part I really struggled with because I continued showing up to these events as a sober person who wasn't really out as a sober person is the expectation being there. If I want to advance in the workplace, if I want to show up where the clients are going to be and where we're going to be having these important meetings that lead to the next year, two, three years of work, 
then I'm gonna have to sit with everyone who's drinking and have them potentially ask me why I'm not drinking. And you know what I'm not gonna do in front of a potential client? Well, you know, I'm an alcoholic and I'm really struggling right now, but you should work with us because, you know, I, I, I'm better and I promise you I won't fall off the wagon. So these situations that we put our potential colleagues or our colleagues into and we say, you know, if you wanna advance in your career, you're gonna show up at the bar or you're gonna show up for dinner and you're gonna potentially subject yourself to being asked why you're not drinking. Um, and I would argue we don't see this in other industries. I would definitely say that other industries have alcohol issues, okay? We know that the medical industry and, and law, there's a high rate of alcohol use and abuse, but it's not during working hours. It's not part of the working culture. I just read where an airline attended, or a, a pilot on his way to Philadelphia was removed before the flight took off and arrested because he tested over the limit for alcohol consumption. Well, you can drink as few as two drinks to be over the limit. So if a pilot can't sit around and drinking two or three drinks and then get off and take a, a, a plane full of people to Philadelphia, why is it okay for designers or um, developers to be drinking that, that much during the day and then do their job? So I think we need to think about the perception that other fields have of us as professionals. Are we a fraternity that, that sits around drinking all day? Is that the cool perception we want everybody to have of us? Or do we want to be taken seriously as you know, professionals in a field that's really to be respected? Um, so we look at these other industries and we don't see that type of a workplace culture during the day. But why is this a problem? The problem is that we actually contribute to the potential for people who are trying to stay sober to not stay sober when we create a culture like this. I mean, when I was first sober, I looked around and, and nothing else changed. I was the only thing that had changed and we still had the office keg and people were still drinking and we were still having all of our events at the bar. So we really don't contribute to our, our colleagues staying sober when we create a culture like this. We alienate and exclude other people. Do you remember those people that emailed me, the ones that are pregnant, the ones that are on antipsychotic medications, the ones that have suffered abuse from people who were abusing alcohol? We're excluding them in these situations. And I heard a rumor too that you turn into a real jerk when you get drunk, and so people that feel already excluded, if they do decide to show up and everybody gets drunk, all of a sudden become the butt of the jokes or feel even more uncomfortable. Well, that's what we're doing when we create this type of a culture. Also, we encourage people to make poor decisions when we say, open bar, have as much as you want, okay? Victor, the old Victor, the two years ago guy, that was great. That was gonna save me so much money because I was gonna drink so much of your beer and then I was gonna go make so many poor decisions for the rest of the night, I probably wouldn't remember a lot of them. Not an excuse and not a good thing. There's no, but there's no cost attached to it when it's an open bar. So a summary point on that is just we don't create an inclusive culture when we focus on alcohol use. We, we create an exclusive atmosphere in the name of culture. But don't worry. Sorry, don't worry. I have a solution. So simply put, if we're going to provide alcohol at our workplaces and events, then it's our obligation to provide an inclusive and safe environment for everybody. That's simple, right? All right, how the hell do we do that? That's, that's one of my four letter words right there. How the hell do we do that? Well, don't worry, I've got some pithy quotes that are gonna get us there. First, we're gonna be the change we wanna see in the world. Now, I always struggle with quotes, and the reason I struggle with quotes is because the more you look into them, the harder it is to say that they actually happened from the person who, said, who we say happened. So I don't know if this was Gandhi or Mother Teresa or Nelson Mandela or somebody else who is really highly quoted, but I think it was Gandhi. That's what I finally landed on. So be the change you want to see in the world. Still, it's just a quote. There's not a lot of meaning going on there in terms of how do I be that change. And so that's where I decided to add Victor's extra quote, which is making that change is hard as shit, okay? <laughs> so I can tell you from being two years sober that any change you try to do is hard as shit. So what I'm gonna focus on from this point to the end of my presentation is the being the change we can be. And I want to tell you, I acknowledge up front, it is hard as shit. It is not easy to change. It's not easy to change one little thing about yourself. And so 
I respect that, and even listening to this and taking it to heart is the beginning of something, but I don't expect you're all gonna leave and the difference is gonna be made the very next day. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So first of all, simply enough, but it needs to be said, it's about your words. It's about how you talk about things. When I first became sober, one of the most difficult things for me about office events was there was nothing, what I called a sober reference point. There was nobody else saying, hey, I'm still going to the bar, but I'm not gonna drink, and the reason I'm not gonna drink is because I don't need to, and I'm staying sober, and I really want you to come too. I knew there were gonna be people at events that weren't drinking, but I didn't know why, and they weren't being vocal about it. So really saying, even if you're going to an event and drinking, saying, hey, we still wanna see people who aren't gonna be drinking. We're not gonna be harassing you or interrogating you. We want you there. We're having an event. It does involve alcohol, but it's not about coming and getting drunk. We need to actually say those words out loud. Second, don't ask people why they're not drinking. And I know it's somewhat of a flippant thing to say or somewhat of an icebreaker, hey, why aren't you drinking? But those are all, that's a proxy question for a whole bunch of shitty questions, okay? What you're really saying, hey, are you pregnant? Hey, are you on antipsychotic medications that don't mix well with alcohol? Uh, you know, so there's no reason. Those aren't questions that we have the right to know the answer to. And the best somebody can say is, I'm not drinking because of a problem, and then what do you do after that? Help them solve that problem? Well, that's not your job, and that's not what you're sitting in the bar to do. So don't ask people why they're, drink why they're not drinking. And, and to make it even clearer, I've created a formula. It's not proprietary, so feel free to share it. Anytime you think about whether or not you should ask someone why they're not drinking, just don't. That's the answer. As soon as the thought comes to your head, don't. But this, don't. But what about, no. So <laughs> Never, well what if, no, not even then. Never, that's when you should ask somebody, and that's who you should ask, is no one, even somebody who's your best friend. And the reason for that is because being sober is a very personal thing, okay? We all have our own personal relationship with alcohol. And for me, being sober meant, I don't know if I'm gonna be drunk again the next day. And if I tell you that I'm sober, and then I'm drunk again the next day, what does that mean for our relationship? If you're my employer, and I tell you I struggle with alcohol, and then you see me drinking three days later, does that mean you need to worry about me? Does that mean you need to monitor me? Does that mean you need to increase you know, your scrutiny of what I'm doing because you know I struggle with alcohol and now I'm drinking again? I don't feel comfortable telling you that. I mean, I didn't invent AA. Anonymous alcoholism exists because people struggle with the after effects of becoming sober. And what's the most common thing you hear about people who've become sober is that they relapse. So it's not something that doesn't happen. It actually happens a majority of the time. So there's really not, no situation that I can think of that you need to ask somebody why they're not drinking where the answer is something that then you can turn around and help them with. All right, so that's your words. Let's talk a little bit about policy and planning. If you're in a position, and I think that we're in a field where we have a lot of smaller events where people are often even just informally put in a position where they're planning something. So I hope that some of this, uh, these suggestions can be used by many of you. So first of all, making support easily accessible. This one is tough. This is the toughest one. For me, I was challenged by a counselor that I was seeing to go to AA for 90 days straight when I first became sober. Sometimes I knew I was not gonna make it to AA in the evening and I would sneak away at lunchtime, but I didn't need to sneak away because I wasn't being monitored. I was in a situation where if you got your work done, that was fine. Not everybody is in this situation and not everybody is gonna feel comfortable saying, I need to leave at 3 p.m., but I'll make up my work later, but I need to attend an AA meeting today. So I would like to stall just think about how can we make support accessible for people who need it. Um, and, and I don't have the perfect answer for that. Hold events at places that are not bars. Sounds simple enough. There's a lot of venues out there that don't serve alcohol. Or even if alcohol is a part of it, for example, we do things like softball. We have whitewater rafting. Um, some of our, our engagement leads went horseback riding together. I can only imagine how special that was. But it didn't focus <laughs> on alcohol. That's my point. They might have even had a few beers afterwards, but the event itself wasn't, hey, come out and, and let's all drink. Let's go somewhere, not call a bar, do some things, and get to know each other. Provide decent non-alcoholic options. This is really important. I like really, really, really cold seltzer water, but you know, 
having something that just doesn't look like it came from the land of misfit drinks is, is important because why do you want to see your event planner going through a ton of trouble to find the tastiest craft beers out there, the, the most exotic and exquisite craft beers, and then um, you know there's a water fountain over there or whatever. It's, it, it, it does impact how you feel about an event when you realize like everybody's going to be there focusing on the drinking and nobody's going to remember the fact that people who aren't drinking alcohol still have taste buds. I think that if you're going to have an event, particularly a company event, it's a responsibility for you to make sure there's designated drivers or that you're willing to pay out of pocket for cab fare to get people home safe or their stay in a hotel. So if you're going to make open bar option, then you need to make sure you do that. Then you can also stop making alcohol free at some point. Make people buy their own drinks. All right, so quickly, at conferences and events, what can we do? Still, never ask anybody why they're not drinking. Hold after parties at non-bar venues. I would like you to ask yourself if you're holding in or hosting an event, does actually having alcohol increase your attendance? Is your event so bad that people need to be drunk throughout the whole time? <laughs> um, and, and like, if not having alcohol doesn't do anything, then maybe you don't need to have that expense and you can put it towards something else. And then I would also say we have an issue around code of conducts in this field. Your code of conduct becomes really worthless when people are too drunk to remember it. I promise you that, no matter what you want to think. When people are, have an access to an open bar, you're washing away your code of conduct in that alcohol. And you can refer to the AlterConf code of conduct, which says there will be no alcohol on site, if you want a reference for what a good code of conduct looks like that, that also doesn't include alcohol. So here, I would just like to show you how simple it can be. This is a message from a Facebook event that felt inclusive to me. I didn't actually attend the event, I will be honest about that. But all they did was simply acknowledge the fact that some people were going to show up to the event without the intention of drinking alcohol. So, hey, yes, there will be other things available. This was in their FAQ section, which meant they were acknowledging as part of the event and its structure, people are going to show up to not necessarily drink alcohol. All right, so now I'm going to wrap it up. I want to say one thing is, this is personal. This is very personal to me. It, I'm passionate about it because of my past experience. Um, but it isn't just about me. Your relationship with alcohol is personal. So I respect that. And I know that everybody here has to determine what they feel like their comfort level is with alcohol. Nothing I've said today and nothing I will ever say is I want to monitor individuals and their alcohol consumption. I want you to understand your relationship with alcohol, the way you feel comfortable with it, but I think that our companies and our culture in, in our design and tech fields does need to acknowledge that not everybody has the same myopic view of, of alcohol and is able to handle out drinking alcohol the same way. Um, I'd like you to think that we can all play a role in making our events feeling more inclusive, uh, particularly for people who are choosing to abstain. And you can do that with your words and with your policy and planning. So your words matter, what you say matters, how you say it matters, how you introduce an event matters, and how you get people to come matters. I don't know why it included an extra slide in between a number of these. but. Um, uh, your work policies matter for providing a safe, inclusive work environment for everybody. Um, how can you get people access to support? Uh, and then conference and event planners uh, should consider the role alcohol is going to be playing in their experience. So if you don't need alcohol, you shouldn't necessarily have it. And then I would just leave you with, if we're going to provide alcohol at our workplaces and events, then it's our obligation to provide an inclusive and safe environment for everyone that's going to be attending. And this is an old picture of me. Um, I do have some additional resources. I'm not sure if the deck will be posted anywhere. But if not, you can follow up with me. And I'd be more than happy to share statistics or anecdotes or anything related to alcohol. So thank you very much for your time today.